Well, good afternoon and welcome to another Lunch and Learn here at TELUS. I'm so glad you've all come to enjoy our program today. It's a pleasure seeing you all here. Um, I'm David Dundee, I'm Director of Education. And uh, for you folks just coming in, there's some more tables being put up, so there'll be plenty, plenty of room for everybody to sit down to lunch and learn. Um, just wanted to let you know about some topics coming up in the Lunch and Learn series. Uh, next month, on uh, July 20th, uh, we have uh, a, our subject of hurricanes. And uh, Dr. Matt uh, Sikowski, who is the editor-in-chief at uh, the Weather Channel, will be here uh, to uh, talk about hurricanes. In fact, if you like weather and like having fun with weather, on Saturday, uh, July 13th, uh, we have our program called Wild About Weather. And uh, we'll have all sorts of interactive activities in our great hall uh, investigating weather. We'll have a group of uh, folks coming up from the uh, Georgia Tech uh, Research Institute that their specialty is in predicting uh, uh, weather. And uh, also, Glenn Burns will be here, and he'll be doing a talk. Uh, so come meet Glenn Burns. Come enjoy our weather day. Uh, the WSB rev weather truck will be here, unless it's summoned elsewhere. But we're predicting good weather that day. But anyway, uh, that'll be a fun uh, 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 day. Our next uh, Lunch and Learn in uh, August, uh, on August 31st, will be a virtual guest, uh, Charles Law, who is an astronomer. And he's going to be talking about the very first images coming back from the uh, Webb Space Telescope, which is currently orbiting out there just about a million miles away from the Earth. So that'll be an exciting uh, talk as well. And uh, also uh, coming up, a couple of uh, things uh, to tell you about, uh, and, and that is uh, on our virtual learning, uh, we have something called Ask the Expert. And once a month, I host this program that you can tune into on our, our YouTube and Facebook page uh, from, uh, from TELUS. And so our next one is on uh, at 2 o'clock on July 13th, and don't have to worry about if you're, oh, I'm busy that afternoon, because it stays stored on our, on our website for a while, so you can tune in later. But we'll have George Blanco talking about model rocketry and blasting off rockets. And by the way, if you like model rockets, it just so happens on uh, July 20th, and, that, and the following Saturday, we have a rocket workshop here at TELUS that you can pre-register for. You can build a rocket, learn about uh, NASA rockets from our NASA ambassador, and blast off your rockets here at TELUS, and then take your rockets home with you. So it's pretty cool stuff. And then on uh, August the 10th, our next Ask the Expert will be with our own uh, uh, paleontologist, Ryan Rooney, and he'll be talking about adventures with fossils. So that should be great fun. So those are some of the things uh, that are coming up uh, in uh, those series. And uh, also, uh, I do want to let you know uh, that we have a wonderful talk here today. And it's all about light and all sorts of things. Uh, be careful to be flying electrons and protons and stuff coming off here from the front. I, I was here yesterday while uh, 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 Mark was practicing in the middle of a meeting. This, this rubber ball comes shooting past me, and I hear this voice from behind me. Oh, don't worry. It's an escape photon. But anyway, so, but, uh, so it may happen today. Um, so Mark Bowen is our, a volunteer here at TELUS. He's a, a very uh, uh, committed here volunteer. He's in the observatory all the time, and he's a wonderful uh, 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 addition to uh, our program here at TELUS. We're lucky to have him. And Mark is an Atlanta native. Um, he lives in Marietta with his wife, Mary. He's retired after 32 years at Lockheed, just down the road. And he graduated from uh, Georgia Tech uh, in a degree in mechanical engineering. And uh, he enjoys tinkering with all sorts of things in science and physics and kayaking, biking, and 
I hope this is not happening today, but it's on his bio, and dangerous experiments in his man cave. <laughs> okay, Mary, you're, you're a brave woman. Anyway, so with that, I w I'll leave the uh, podium now to a, go to a safe distance and leave Mark to come up here. <laughs> oh, hi. Will do. All right, thanks for the great intro, David. So I've got a great, great big crowd here today. Thanks for coming. I've got to tell you, I've had so much fun putting this together. All this good scientific stuff. It's just been, it's been great fun. And I'm thrilled here today to talk to you about light, photons, electrons, dill pickles, and other tales from the electromagnetic spectrum. So let's go ahead and jump into it. I'm going to cover these topics today to answer the question, what is this thing we call light? We're going to talk about light that we can see with our eyes is just a little piece of a bigger spectrum. Light has wave and particle characteristics, travels very fast, excited electrons generate light, and there's hidden information in the sun and stars. And we've got to be good scientists and detectives to figure out what that hidden information is. So, okay, the electromagnetic spectrum, it runs, you see on the left, the uh, short wavelength high energy gamma rays to the real long wavelength radio waves. A little rainbow colored wafer in the center is all of that that our eyes can see, not a very big piece of the whole, but it runs from very, very uh, dark, deep violet at uh, 400 nanometers up to dark red at 700 nanometers. And I'll just go ahead and explain. You'll hear me use that term a lot in this lecture, nanometer. Meter is, of course, a unit of length, and nano is one one billionth. So a nanometer is one one billionth of a second, a very useful unit of measure. So we said light has wave and particle characteristics. So if light's a wave, back to basics, what exactly is a wave anyway, and what is waving? Good question. Let's explore that. Well, on the lower left, you'll see that there's uh, sound waves. Now, sound waves are waves, but they're actually pressure waves. The pressure waves of sound rattle our eardrum, and our brain makes music and speech out of it, and those are sound waves. You go to the beach to have a little uh, beachside fun, and you see the, uh, the waves of the ocean washing up on the beach. Well, those waves have peaks, they have troughs, and the distance between the waves is a wavelength. You know, and if you're, uh, they're high enough and space just right, you can get uh, great rides on your uh, boogie board. <laughs> One of our favorite things to do as a family, but today we're talking about light waves, otherwise known as electromagnetic waves, so-called electromagnetic because if you ask what is waving in a light wave, you have a, an electric field and a magnetic field. They're in lockstep and they're waving, and that is a light wave. A little science and math, nothing too heavy here, just to point out that light travels at the speed of light. We call it C. There's a certain frequency, those would be vibrations a second, um, cycles a second, oscillations a second, and just like water waves, there's a certain wavelength. Those are related by that formula at the bottom that the speed of light, we call it C, is equal to frequency times wavelength. Now the speed of light never changes, but two things that do change uh, opposite each other are frequency and wavelength. Let me do a little quick uh, demonstration to illustrate that. We'll make our own uh, wave here and we'll kind of show you the uh, relationship that when frequency goes up, wavelength goes down. Short, wave, short wavelengths make high frequencies. and We can actually demonstrate that with this uh, spring here, otherwise known as a slinky. <laughs> So yeah, I'm 68 years old and I get to play with slinkies. I'm lucky. Now this little blue box here is a musician's metronome. I play a percussion drum set and guitar and I use this little guy to keep my rhythm straight. But also, I can, uh, I can put certain oscillation modes in this spring. Now the basic, the basic vibration here is just nice and slow and easy. And it's about 70 beats a minute. Now, real slow, slow vibrations, only 70 beats a minute. That's not even a full wave. That's just a half a wave. But now, if I double the frequency from 70 to 140, what's going to happen? Let's bring that up.
So now you see a full wave. There's a dead spot in the middle and a peak on either side. I've doubled the frequency, but the wavelength is half. Let's go up one more. Let's triple that fundamental frequency. So three times 70 is uh, 210. We'll calm it down from that mode. This is the uh, second harmonic. And you'll see, before I do it, I'll tell you what you'll see. You'll see a peak in the middle, a dead spot each side of that peak, and, then, and, and a peak on either side of that. You'll see three. So here we go. Triple the uh, frequency, one-third the wavelength. So indeed, the relationship of wavelength and frequency is they're inverse of each other. Okay, so how fast does light travel? Simple answer, very fast, 186,000 miles per second fast. Um, just some examples of the time it takes light to cover some pretty large distances. You know, the sun's 93 million miles away, and it takes it uh, about eight and a third minutes to reach us. Planet Saturn is even further away at uh, 484 million miles, but even that light gets to us from, from Jupiter on the average in less than an hour, 43 minutes. A long, long distance away is our sister galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy. Light from a star in that galaxy gets to us in 2.4 million years. It's that far away. And that is, by the way, in astronomy, is the unit to measure a light year. Andromeda galaxy is 2.4 million light years away. But let's, uh, let's talk about some distances a little uh, closer to what we can get our arms around, closer to home. And perhaps distances in this room, me to you, uh, that kind of thing. So I have here in my hand a little arrow bar, and it's labeled with a decimal, one one billionth. And S is for seconds. That is a one billionth, a nanosecond. And the, the length of this arrow is light, if it starts at the base, in one nanosecond, it makes it to the tip. This is a one nanosecond light bar. And so that's kind of a, gives you a little feel for how fast light is. Another thing that's kind of interesting about it, and as luck would have it, just happenstance, this is almost a, exactly a foot in length. So light travels about a nanosecond and a foot. Like for instance, you know, ma'am, you there on the end? You're like maybe 15 feet away. So light from your smiling face gets to me in 15 nanoseconds. So that's a little discussion on the speed of light. So now, we said light has wave and particle characteristics, um, but how do we know that light is a wave? The experiment that showed scientists that light has wave-light behavior is the double slit experiment. In that experiment, you have a piece of material with two very, very thin slits that are very close to each other, and when you shine a light, say light from a laser, you can see here a green pattern and a red pattern, Light comes through those two slits, and they're close together, and it, when it glows out the other side, it comes out, just like this picture shows, almost like circular ripples is a way of illustrating that, and the light from the two slits can interfere with each other because they're waves. So you could have uh, a, a high peak from wave from one slit and a high peak from the other add together to make a very high peak. That's a bright spot in this pattern you see on the... Uh, on the right there. The air green arrow is pointing to a bright spot. Conversely, you can have a peak from one slit and a trough from the other add together and cancel out. That's because it's acting like, uh, they're acting like waves. Now, if that's a little difficult to understand that from that graphic, let's look at it from something that we're uh, familiar with. So all of us at some point in time taken a, a rock and thrown it, you know, into a lake or pond and it's made a splash and the waves kind of come apart like circular ripples from that. Well, those waves have a strong, there's a strong analogy to light waves. So what happens if you don't just throw one rock in a pond, but you got two rocks and you throw them down at the same instant, that splash is gonna make two sets of water waves and those waves are gonna all interfere with each other. Uh, look at the uh, tip of the, uh, the red arrow. What that's pointing to, you can see that, that's actually a high point. It's like a little mountain peak on a mountain ridge. What's happening there is the peak of the wave from one rock 
and the peak of the wave from the other rock that hit the water added together and made that high peak. Now the tip of the black arrow is pointing, it looks like a crater in the water. That's because the peak from one wave and a, and a trough from the other rock's wave canceled each other out and you get that low spot. That's very much like light waves adding and, and subtracting to each other that come from two slits. And in fact, if you shine a laser light through two slits very close together, we're gonna do that in a moment, you get that pattern across the bottom. That's called an interference pattern. So that uh, aperture card there is the magnified, magna, magnified view of what's on that table ahead of me and to my right, your left. And I'm gonna step down and we're gonna actually shine a red laser through the slits on the far right and make that pattern. And um, I'm gonna project it Two different, I'm gonna project it on the light brown and the darker brown wall here. And um, you won't see me, but you'll be able to see the effect of that. So this little card here is exactly what's on the screen. I've got a red laser, pretty bright. And um, so if I move it onto the slit, there it is, there's that interference pattern. Light waves from the right and left slits are adding and subtracting to make that. And we can go down a little bit lower. It's a little bit different contrast, probably looks a little bit better there. So indeed, light has wave characteristics. I'll need that later. <laughs> So, light will behave as a wave, and we said it'll also behave as a particle. And talk about the particle nature of light, we're talking about the photon. That's the name given to light acting as a particle. So photon, what's some definitions of that? Well, they are the particles and the particle nature of light. They're the smallest possible packets of electromagnetic energy. Now, photons aren't particles like we're kind of used to in our world, like a golf ball or a grain of sand or even a, a little fleck of dust floating in a sunbeam. But they do have certain properties. Photons of light, the light particles we're discussing here, they have no mass and they have no electric charge. But they do have an associated uh, wavelength and frequency, and photons always travel at the speed of light. Now, photons do have energy, and a photon has momentum. A photon has no mass, but it does have momentum. In fact, a photon of light, because of its momentum, it can crash into something, and that momentum will send that, whatever it runs into, electron, for instance, flying off. So, okay, how do scientists discover that light sometimes behaves as a particle? Well, this is the uh, photoelectric effect. Einstein, Albert Einstein, was the first to fully explain the ramifications of this effect won him the 1921 Nobel Peace Prize. But in this effect, electrons are ejected when, fo when a photon strikes a metal plate, one photon ejects one electron. The photon acting like a particle with momentum hits that plate and the electron goes off and flies away. Now that effect cannot be explained by wave theory. You know, one way to look at it through something we're familiar with, who in here has ever shot a game of pool? <laughs> Well, when you, shoot, when, you, when you hit that cue ball and it goes flying across the table and hits another pool ball, and that, that pool ball goes off, maybe it goes in a pocket and you're getting ahead in your game. But what hap what's happening there is that cue ball has momentum that goes, and when it hits that other pool ball, that pool ball has that momentum transferred to it and it flies away. And um, even think of it like a bowling. You roll a bowling ball down an alley, you don't get a gutter ball, it hits the bowling pin, it scatters them. Same thing here is the electrons acting like a particle hit a plate. Electrons, another particle, are scattered. There's nothing that explains that in wave theory. The only conclusion you can make is that light must have particle characteristics in addition to its wave characteristics. Let's investigate that with a couple of demonstrations. So I've got, uh, I've got three, uh, Three fundamental particles here. Get ready to duck, David. <laughs> this, yellow, this yellow ball here represents a photon of visible light, an orange photon. You know, in that uh, rainbow spectrum, orange is kind of between red and yellow. 
So at any, any rate, so this is a visible light photon, and this is this dark purple one here, hard to see in the dark, that's kind of by intent because this is an ultraviolet photon. It's got a whole lot more energy. It can carry a whole lot more energy and actually would have enough, enough energy to transfer um, and eject an electron. This being our good friend, the electron here, uh, labeled E negative because electrons carry negative charge. But if you have an electron down on a plate and you have this visible light, low energy photon, it comes down and hits that electron. Really nothing happens because there's not enough energy to transfer. But this ultraviolet photon, it ejected that electron and rolls across the room in the process. So that's kind of um, a little demo analogy to what's happening in the photoelectric effect. Photon hits plate, got enough energy, electrons are ejected. Now let's do the real experiment. So we're going to actually do the real photoelectric experiments, very close cousin to uh, what Einstein and some other scientists did when they were investigating this effect. A little bit of explanation here. We'll touch on a little bit of the science of electrostatics. I've got a silk cloth here, and I've got a hard rubber rod. Silk likes to give up electric charge. Rubber rods like to take in electric charge. So I can rub this on here and put charge on this and transfer it down through this apparatus called an electroscope. Very simply, I'll take it out of the holder for a second. Microphone stand. Let me take this out. So what I have here is a piece of pure zinc. That's like 99.9% .9 pure zinc. And it's on a... Uh, it's on a coil of wire. That wire runs through this electrode down to these aluminum foil leaves. There are two of them here that you can't see because they're touching each other. So now, let me put this back in and secure it. Probably go in that direction. So now these two aluminum foil leaves are touching each other. There's no attractive or repelling force. You know how we've always heard that uh, light, light charges repel, opposite charges attract? If I can put negative charge electrons into this plate, they'll run down to these leaves here, and these leaves will both be negatively charged, and they'll spread apart. So let's do that. I'm stripping electrons off the silk cloth, putting it on this rod. And after a while, I'll get enough in here to get a spread on those, uh, those leaves. Takes a few strokes to get them to separate. Starting to come apart as I'm building up electric charge down in those foil leaves. They are um, repelling each other more and more and more. I'll get it far enough apart so you can really see it well. Can you see how that's spread apart? Is that pretty easy to see? All right. So there now, there's a lot of electric charge, a lot of negative charge in here. But if I can drive electrons off this zinc plate by hitting it with ultraviolet photons, then those photons will go flying away into the room and it'll, and it'll draw electrons from here. It'll draw negative charge from down below, run up the wire. Photons are kicking them away just like a second ago. So here we go. This is a, this is a safe level of ultraviolet light. It's, it's um, actually a, from a reptile terrarium say for animals and, and people. So I'm going to turn it on and I'm going I'm to hammer that piece of zinc with these ultraviolet photons. In a minute, you'll see those leaves start to close up. In fact, at this point, they're completely touching. So we indeed drove electrons off. They came out of the four leaves. They weren't repelled anymore, so they came back together. So indeed, light does have particle properties. So where does light come from anyway? What causes it, causes it to be produced? On this slide, I'm going to talk about two methods. And we'll touch on the third one in a minute. Um, but they kind of both deal with our friend, the electron. Now, excited electrons produce light. It doesn't matter if you accelerate or decelerate an electron, excited in any kind of way, it generates light. It's just a property of physics. Another way we get light associated with electrons is in, in an atom, you have different energy levels, different orbital levels, as we call it. 
And as an electron moves from a higher to a low orbit, it goes from high energy to low energy. That lost energy isn't destroyed because energy is neither created nor destroyed, but becomes a photon. Let me, uh, let me illustrate this here, and it will uh, be a little clearer if we look at it from the basis of this uh, model of the atom. So, okay, this is a model of a hydrogen atom. Now, it's, it's the model that we call the Bohr, B-O-H-R, named after Niels Bohr that described it. It's really, atoms don't really look like this. This is like a baby solar system, but it does convey some important truths. You guys probably need me to have it back a little bit over there so you can see it too. Okay, everybody can see that now? Good. So, but what this does show is uh, an atom has, this hydrogen atom has a nucleus, happens to be a single proton for hydrogen, and you can have an electron residing at a certain energy level orbit. That innermost orbit is its rest state, it's unenergized. But now, what if that electron resides, say, in the third energy level, the third orbit here? And again, these rings are not for supplementary electrons, they just represent different energy levels in an atom. So now, if this electron gets tired of being in the third orbit, and it makes a quantum leap down to the, uh, to the next orbit, one step down, it's lost energy. What happens then is that that energy leaves in the form of a red colored photon, which is this right here. That is created at the, at the going from the third to the second orbit. And if it's all the way up to this higher fourth energy level orbit, light is created when this drops down two levels to here, but in this case, it creates a much higher, much more energetic blue-green photon. And so these, uh, these photons are both leaving. Now, you have, uh, you know, you have like a, have a, you know, untold myriads of these leaving at once. This actually is the light that will come to our eye, and you can see, the, see these colors here. By the way, in hydrogen, these have certain names. The red photon is 656 nanometers. It's called hydrogen alpha. And this is shorter wavelength, uh, but higher frequency, and we call it hydrogen beta, 486. Don't have to exactly remember that, but it'll, it'll kind of be touched on again in a minute. So that's a little bit about, um, little bit about the uh, little uh, atomic level science. So let's do two more. Let's do, let's do uh, some experiments and demos, and uh, let's make some electrons get excited and generate some light for us. Beginning with this right here is a, uh, you can see it okay, is a plasma ball. I don't know if any of you have these at home. It's a real pretty thing. Those tendrils of light are, are beautiful. And, uh, but this thing has is, is got some incredible science associated with it. Well, what's happening is that center electrode has a very high electric potential, and that electric uh, field energy, that electric energy wants to leave and go to uh, a lower potential. When it does, it goes through the gases in this, uh, the gases in this uh, globe. It makes the electrons in the neon and krypton of what have you, it makes electrons kind of jump in and out of object orbit and it makes these beautiful tendrils of light. Now one of the neat things about a plasma globe is the uh, electric energy doesn't stop right at the edge here. Oh yeah, if you have one of these at home, you probably notice it'll follow your finger around because it's looking for a path of least resistance so that that bright tendril can come to my finger and my body acts like a, an electric ground. But anyway, um, this energy doesn't stop at the edge. I can hold this as a fluorescent light tube. I borrowed it from my wife's uh, kitchen counter light. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mary. So if I hold this next to it, you can see it's glowing. So it's you know, it's dark up here, the closer I get, it will actually start glowing. And so it's, uh, it's producing light. Now this is another kind of fluorescent light bulb, an energy saver bulb, it's mercury vapor based. And I bring it close to this, and it glows too, I don't even have to get very close, and it glows. And uh, the mercury vapor in there, again, electrons excited in and out of orbit, excited electrons create light. This is a very simple thing here. It's just a hollow glass tube, and it's filled with just pure neon gas. But when, I, uh, when I, I hold it next to this, 
it flames on. It produces the uh, beautiful light. That's kind of like the light from a neon sign. Now, I'm touching the side of it now, but I can move it out. I could even move it out that far, and it's still, uh, it's still energized and still producing light. Move it away, move it back, and it glows. Whoops, wrong thing. And I'm killing this. So, all right, here we go. Um, okay, now, I wonder if anybody... Um, I wonder if anybody, when they first saw the title of this lecture, wondered, what in the world do dip, dill pickles have to do with light and electromagnetic spectrum? <laughs> yeah, somebody may have just wondered that. Well, we, uh, the, uh, the riddle will be explained here momentarily. So I got, I've got, a, I've got uh, some pickles here. And I have an apparatus in front of me First, I'll explain a pickle. Let's get the biggest one out of the jar for maximum effect here. So, okay. So, when they make a dill pickle, they take a cucumber and they soak it in a pickling solution. A pickling solution is full of sodium. So, in the time that this is soaked in that pickling solution, this whole pickle is full of sodium atoms, sodium salts and what have you. So, um, what I have here little apparatus I built. Oh, by the way, this isn't a good thing to do at home. There's about three or four ways you can electrocute yourself. <laughs> it's a lot more fun to electrocute a pickle than yourself. But this has two nails in it hooked to a wire, and I can put, uh, I can put wall current through these two nails. So what I'm going to do, because it's a little bit juicy, I'm going to put this down over it. Okay. So we'll take this poor hapless pickle here and we're going to jam it on these, these nails. All right. Got a little off center, but that won't matter. So what I'm about to do is uh, plug this in and shoot power through this pickle. And you'll see at first nothing happens. Then it'll kind of sweat and it'll drip a little bit. Then it'll start spewing and hissing and shooting geysers of steam up in the air. And then suddenly it crackles on, just like a real light bulb. In fact, it's a, it's a very close cousin to a sodium vapor street lamp in your neighborhood. So, okay, I'm going to plug it in. And I have to switch it on. There's two uh, safety steps. Again, this is a little bit unsafe, but I like it. <laughs> All right, here we go. Power to the pickle. Ah, it already slid down a little bit. So it's just kind of sitting there, one soggy mess, and starting to bubble a little bit. We'll start seeing the first little wisps of steam come out of it. I think I see some now. I don't know if you, if you can hear it through my mic. All right, it's getting a, a little more excited now. And there it is. The, uh, the yellow glow of energized sodium. Sodium, electrons in sodium going in and out of orbit, making our lowly dill pickle glow in a beautiful yellow color. So there you have it. No more mystery of what the electric pickle is. <laughs> Okay, you know, light's produced by our sun, produced by other stars. What's happening there is those different stars have different kinds of thermonuclear processes in their core, generates light. Now, that light has to come through a real traffic jam, the core of a sun or star. It's so dense, so energetic, it can take a photon of light 170,000 years to get to the surface, at which point it gets to us in about eight and a third minutes. Now, we know hot objects, uh, hot objects, give off light. You know, the, the red lava from a volcano, you heat up a piece of metal red hot, uh, the, the uh, filaments in a light bulb, they're hot and they glow. Well, what's happening there? Pretty simple. Heat energy is just vibrational energy. Heat energy, sometimes we call it thermal energy, 
It's just vibrations kind of at the atomic and molecular level. So something hot, the atoms are vibrating. With it, there are electrons. Electrons get excited. What do excited electrons do? They give off light. And so that's why hot things glow. It's really the, kind of the same story. Okay, we've talked a lot about visible light. Let's go to that far right end of the electromagnetic spectrum, away from what we see, to radio waves. Radio waves are important to us because they, uh, you know, Wi-Fi, um, you know, a, a stereo, um, other things. Uh, our cell phones, particularly, um, use radio waves. So what happens to, to, create, to create and broadcast radio waves? Well, I've got a, an antenna here that I took off an old dead uh, personal stereo. And so we're going to build ourselves a little radio transmitter and broadcast some radio waves. So now what happens is that in a radio transmitter, you put electrical currents in an antenna like this. These currents are accelerating up and down. Accelerated currents generate electromagnetic magnetic waves. In the case of this, they're radio waves. Now we've said a minute ago that that uh, plasma ball puts out energy above and beyond just the wall of it. So we can use it as, a, uh, as an energizing source for this antenna. I'm going to put the antenna up against the uh, plasma ball. Can you guys see that over there? I might, I don't know, ease that back. I hope, hope that's visible from that table over there. I want everybody to enjoy this. So when I, uh, when I activate this plasma ball, you will see a filament go from the middle of the plasma ball to the edge where the antenna is, it will glow red. And so there is energy coupling and connecting this antenna going up and down. So now all I've got to do is have a way of listening to it. So I'm going to bring up my stereo here. I've got it tuned to AM530, seems to work well. A little bit of volume. Now we're going to fire up our, uh, our uh, radio transmitter here. So you'll notice as the, uh, as the filament is making and breaking connection with that, it's moving and all that, the uh, sound that you hear, those pulsations, are exactly in, in, in time with that filament. All right, the beautiful melodic sounds of a plasma ball. <laughs> okay, I said that there's, uh, there's secret messages in the light from the sun and stars, and truly there's more than meets the eye in the light that we see coming from our sun, which is a star, of course, and from other stars. And so we got to figure out what is that secret information? How can we uh, find out what is in that light that we don't necessarily see from the beginning? Beginning with, um, stars have color and brightness. Um, you know, and so you look up in the night sky and you see the different stars are different colors. And I show a few of these here. The point I want to make is that the color of a star equals its temperature, that peak color wavelength will tell you the color, it'll tell you the temperature of the outer atmosphere of that star. Beginning with on the upper left, you see uh, the star Rigel, very hot at 11,000 degrees, it's blue. And you come through past Sirius, it's not as hot. Our sun is, is, is even less hot. At 6,000 degrees, it's almost half as hot as Rigel. And it's kind of yellow white. Now you look up in the night sky and you'll see red stars. This time of year, you look to the south, you see the red star on Taurus and Scorpio. Winter, you see the red star Betelgeuse, it's pictured here. That color tells you its temperature. Now, if you know that star's absolute brightness and its temperature, you now know a lot of information about that star's life cycle and how it produces energy. But there's a whole lot more to sun and starlight than color and brightness, and I want to introduce the, uh, the science of spectral analysis here. What is that? It's pretty simple. If you've ever just uh, looked at a rainbow in the sky, 
after, after a rain, you're doing some spectral analysis. What's happening is that the white light goes through a prism or a diffraction grating or water in the air, and it splits that light into all of its colors. Now, spectral analysis means you look at that spectrum and you analyze the colors for uh, in interesting information there. So let's look at a couple of examples. At the top row is the spectrum from the star Sirius. The bottom spectrum is from our, um, our good uh, local, local neighbor star, the sun. And you'll notice something interesting. First off, there are black lines in those spectrums. What is happening there? It's like someone went up and peeled a strip of color off of that spectrum and left nothing behind. Is that wavelength missing? I'm here to tell you that wavelength is truly missing. It's gone, and because it is, it reveals a lot of interesting information we can use. So, a minute ago, we looked at, uh, you know, that light, we looked at it, uh, when an electron transitions from a high energy level to a low, it generates light. There's an opposite process to that, reciprocal, or shall we say a mirror image process, where you have um, not an electron moving down, but you have the, you have the, uh, you have the opposite thing where, and we'll, we'll use this hydrogen atom to explain that. And so, if you have a photon, again, this is our, our red uh, hydrogen alpha photon, and it's flying through space, and it's, it's uh, flying along nice and happy at the speed of light. What happens if it collides with an electron, say, in the second orbit? When it collides with that electron, that electron absorbs the energy from that photon. In doing so, the photon is gone, and that electron takes that energy, and it moves up to the uh, energy level associated with this energy from the photon. It's a match. It's a one-to-one -one match. Energy in the photon makes the electron move a specific distance. Same thing with um, a higher energy. Again, we're starting on the second level, second energy level, and this is that uh, next more energetic photon. We call it hydrogen beta, 486 nanometers. It comes along and it hits this electron. So it's got a whole lot more energy associated with it what happens with it? Well, that electron moves two steps. In the process, this, this, uh, this color is gone. So if you've got, say, white light that possesses all the colors, but you take these colors out, what's left? Black lines where that energy, where that light was absorbed. So, the science in studying this, spectral analysis science is known as spectrometry, and some science of measuring and analyzing electromagnetic wavelengths. So we'll use a tool here to do that with. You've got to be able to, to take that light and spread it apart and look at it. And um, let's say we are looking at this spectrum here. This spectrum you're looking at, we, it was serious, and it has these dark, these dark absorption lines in it. We think they're hydrogen. Are they really? Let's prove that they are or are not by getting hydrogen emission. If it matches the hydrogen absorption, then we know, yea, verily, those are hydrogen lines. So this is the main tool in the toolbox of uh, spectral analysis. It's a spectrometer. It has a slit in the end. Light comes through, runs the length, hits something that acts like a prism, disperses it, and there's a camera in the end that measures it. So now, what we need to do, we need, a, we need a hydrogen emission spectrum. Well, this, this glass tube here is full of pure hydrogen, has electrical contacts on the end. This black box energizes those. It puts out 5,000 volts. And when you energize it, that tube produces the hydrogen emission. So we're going we're gonna to capture that. Let me go to the... Uh, software for that. So watch what happens when I switch this on. Okay, I'm going to switch it off, but I captured that spectrum. We see the red, aquamarine, and blue that are the exact lines you expect to get with hydrogen. 
Now, let's do a let's do a screen grab snip and paste it onto uh, paste it onto our spectrum of Sirius. And you know, will it match? Let's see. Yeah, it's a perfect match. The emission lines of hydrogen match these absorption lines. We have proved that uh, that is indeed hydrogen, alpha, beta, and gamma absorption lines in Sirius. Now let's go back and look at our electric pickle friend a second ago. In the interest of time, which we're running very short of, uh, <laughs> I uh, had captured, uh, when it started to glow yellow, I had captured its spectrum with this uh, instrument here. It makes that perfect, that perfect line right there where sodium should be, 589 nanometers. Chemists will tell you that is the signature emission of sodium. By the way, it matches that line, that wavelength matches the position in the solar spectrum at the bottom. So what does that tell you? It tells you that in the atmosphere of the sun exists the element sodium because it's absorbing light coming through it and we don't see it. And you'll see uh, otherwise on that, uh, that lower spectrum, you'll see different black lines associated with iron and magnesium and calcium and what have you. That tells us that because those lines are there and we know what they are, that those elements are in the atmosphere of the sun. On a broader sense than just the sun, stars in the sky, if they're close enough to be measurable, we can look at their um, absorption spectra using this tool and we see those black lines we know what elements are in the atmosphere of those stars. It's like you can do a complete chemical analysis of a star you know, a thousand light years away. And uh, it's a very powerful tool and tells us a lot. So uh, we're real close to the end here. Um, so let's do a little bit more. We're right at, we're, we're right at one o'clock. Well, what, let me do us a couple little quick things here that are kind of interesting in the world of, of uh, spectral analysis. Like for instance, I've got, uh, move this aside. So I've got a green and I've got a, a red laser. So, you know, the spectrometer is looking at this white plate. I reflect the red laser off of it. You can see the red spike come up. That's the correct wavelength, like it's written on the laser. The green one comes up. In fact, I can put them both at the same time up here. And you see both the, uh, the red and the green. Even though they're both on the same, they're both reflecting light into the same instrument, it splits it apart. And now with all, a lot of our electronic stuff, we use remotes. And remotes act in the infrared a lot. So um, this is the remote I use for the stereo. And when I put it up here, you can see, you see that big black hump on the far right it's black because it's beyond visible light. It's like 920 nanometers, and we can't see past uh, 700. So, you know, you can, uh, with the same instrument, you can measure that. And one last thing here, this will wrap up the lecture today with one last little test and measurement. I'm gonna put it over here and aim this at those uh, light bulbs over there run the software again. Okay, so two light bulbs. Now the, they both put out what our eye thinks is, is uh, white light, but they're kind of different. Like that, you can see that spectrum there is smooth and continuous running across. But the other one is a fluorescent light bulb. It's sharp and spiky sharp and spiky fluorescent light bulb and smooth and continuous. So again, it just kind of points out this is a great tool to analyze light with. You can learn things about light that you wouldn't know otherwise. And with that, I am going to go back to go back to here. And here. And this concludes the presentation. Uh, we've run just about the speed of light to get to the end. Hey, but, th 
But thanks for attending. I sure do appreciate it. It's been uh, great. I've had a lot of fun. Well, well, thank you, Mark. That was great. And I'm glad the pickle didn't burn down the museum. And uh, <laughs> Close, but we made it. So uh, we ran a little long today. So folks, if you, if you have some questions for Mark, you can come up here. He'll be up on the stage. He'll be glad to ask, answer any of your questions. Thank you so much for attending Lunch and Learn. I hope to see you here back at the museum again real soon. Thank you. I'll be here by the demo board if you want to ask any questions. Thanks.